I'd encourage you to open your copy of God's Word this morning to Psalm 119. That's where we will be camping out today, uh, specifically in verses 97 through 104. We'll get there in a second. Uh, But before we get there, I have kind of an opening question for you. Have you ever acquired a taste for something? Seeing a few heads nod, maybe. Okay, maybe you haven't acquired a taste for something, but maybe you've developed an appreciation for something that once you thought was worthless. Okay, well, this is always dangerous, but I'm going to allow a little bit of crowd participation. Uh, what is, those of you who are nodding your heads, yes, what's one thing that you've acquired a taste for or developed an appreciation for? Brussels sprouts, mushrooms. Brussels sprouts, mushrooms. Coffee. Coffee. Fresh strawberries, okay. I'm hearing a lot of things kids don't like to eat. We've acquired a, t- a taste for. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. All the vegetables, I think, were, were just <laughs> spouted out there. That's good. Um, yeah, we, isn't it funny how we can, we can actually acquire a taste for something? I think there's some scientific stuff behind uh, how our taste buds actually change as we grow and, and change that way. But uh, it is so true that we so often acquire a taste for something. Uh, two things in my life specifically. One was sweet tea. Okay, I, I grew up a sun tea guy. No sugar in my tea. No thank you. That's disgusting. Uh, but God and his goodness to me uh, allowed me to have a roommate in college from Georgia. And he showed me the light of <laughs> sweet tea. And... Um, so he, he converted me there. It took a while. You know, it took me a while to really appreciate the goodness that sweet tea is. Uh, but once you know and understand, uh, there's no going back. Um, and so those of you who are still on the dark side, come to the light. Uh, another one, I heard this one, somebody said this one, but coffee is, a, is another one. Most people, the first couple times that they have coffee or the first hundred times maybe (laughs) that they have coffee think it's bitter and disgusting Uh, but something happens for me it was a job in college where I had to be up at four in the morning and in the cornfields by 4 30 and yes I grew up in Iowa don't judge me too much Uh, but but for me the caffeine that the coffee or maybe it was the bad taste at the time that would wake me up in the morning was worth it Um, and, and as time would have it and as time progressed I actually somehow learned to like it. And that was, that was like the, the bad kind of coffee. I mean, I'm not going to name names or anything like that, but uh, coffee snobs would not have liked that coffee. And so what I learned is that there actually are better types of coffee. And, and before you know it, the, the person who once hated coffee would spit it out because it's just dirty, bitter water now has become a coffee snob. Uh, now, I'm not, I'm not to the point where I measure my beans and grams and, and all. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm not quite to that point. But, but the truth is, we, we can actually acquire a taste for something. So our text this morning in, in Psalm 119, in some ways, I think the psalmist is, is almost encouraging us to, to learn to develop and acquire and improve our taste and hunger and thirst for the word of God. Now, every illustration has its shortcomings. Right? I'm not suggesting this morning that God's word is, is bad and bitter and you have to force yourself to like it. Okay, What I'm suggesting this morning is that God's word is actually the most delicious, the most sweet, the most fulfilling, the most satisfying thing that we could ever consume. And that because of a host of reasons... So often it's easy for us to just leave it on the table and walk by for something else. The psalmist this morning wants us to taste and savor the sweetness of the word of God. And so that's the title of our text this morning, Developing a Taste for God's Word. The theme of Psalm 119, as you guys hopefully know by now, is delighting in God's word. Delighting in the word of the Lord. That's the theme of this whole chapter and it's the goal of the sermon series is that week by week and day by day, we as followers of Christ might, might grow and learn in our ability to delight 
in the word of God. The other shortcoming of that illustration is that our delight and our enjoyment of God's word isn't going to happen just as a result of our trying. Right? It also is a very spiritual and supernatural experience by which the Holy Spirit uses his word to mold us and change us to actually increase our desire in the first place. And so it's interesting that as in a way, as we read and meditate and obey and understand it, we will actually be driven more and more and deeper and deeper into the truths of God's word. This kind of theme starts right off in the first verse here, verse 97, where the psalmist makes an exclamation. He says, oh, how I love your law. Some of you coffee drinkers have said that before, right, about your coffee. Oh, that's a good cup. That's delicious. That's hitting the spot. The, the psalmist has such a delight in God's word here that, that he has to exclaim it. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And so as I came to this verse in my study this week, I, I had to ask the question. He's loving the law. It is his meditation all the day. So the question in my mind was, does his love for God's word draw, drive him to meditate on it, or does he meditate on it and therefore is loving it? And you might have your opinions, but I think the answer is yes. As you read it, you love it more, and as you love it more, you read it more, meditate, memorize it, hide it in your hearts all the more. Spurgeon said, this was the effect of his love to the law and the cause of that love. He meditated in God's word because he loved it, and he loved it all the more because he meditated in it. Just in the previous verse, verse 96, he, he talks about the exceeding perfections of God's word, how he's seen a limit to everything else in the world, a limit to all the other perfection or good things that the world has to offer. But in God's word, he says, your commandment is exceedingly broad. There's no limits to the word of God. And so we have almost the cycle right from verse one, and we're going to come back to that cycle where He's reading and meditating and therefore obeying and growing and delighting. And the more that he delights, the more he reads, the more he reads, the more he wants to obey, and the more he wants to obey, the more he reads. And it's, it's almost the cycle that can feed itself. Now, as we'll get into it, we know that there's things that try to disrupt that cycle. So let's look at verses. Well, sorry, before we get to verse 97, let me just make a note on that phrase, it is my meditation all the day. Okay, there, there's several phrases that the psalmist sometimes use that seem unattainable to us. That, for me, that's one of them, right? Meditation all the day, all day long. What does it mean? Does that mean I can think about nothing else? I have to constantly only be thinking about God's word? Does it mean I can't think about what I'm going to eat for lunch today or what we're going to do to celebrate the 4th of July tomorrow because that would be a distraction from God's word? I don't think it's so much that as it is that it means that our minds are constantly returning to God's truth as our home base. I think of like my kids when they, when they play tag at home. It doesn't happen very often, but, but a couple of times uh, we've played tag or uh, whatever it is, and any game that there's a base. And what happens is the kids spend more time on base than they do running around because they know they're safe on base. Okay, I think that's in some ways the idea of what does it mean to meditate on God's word? It's the, it's the place our mind returns to over and over and over again. You might even think of the other verse in the New Testament that would encourage us to pray without ceasing. To constantly be in prayer. That doesn't mean we're walking around with our eyes closed and uh, verbally praying out loud to God. It's, a, it's really a posture of the heart. It, it's a constant communication with God. It's talking to Him about everything. It's, it's, it's more than just 
having a five minute prayer time at the beginning of your day, but rather it's bringing everything throughout your day to the throne of God. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I've, I've had trouble finding a, a consistent time to be in God's word, even for a small portion of the day. And so the idea of meditating on God's word all the day long is just daunting. But once again, it's the idea of letting God's word dwell in us richly. It's delighting in it. Not so much so that we can spend a certain amount of time every day in God's word, although that's good, but rather so that we might allow God's word and his truth to permeate every aspect of our day. I think sometimes Christians can have this false sense of guilt, like like, I didn't get to my daily devotions this morning. And so now God is looking down with spiteful hate towards me because I didn't check that box today. And I, I just have a hard time thinking that's God's attitude towards how we're interacting with his word. But I, I, I don't think he's going to judge us because we don't read his word every single day. I don't think he's going to judge us because we spend 15 minutes instead of 30 minutes But what we do know is that one day we will be judged according to how we obeyed his word and glorified him with our lives. And so the question then becomes, well, if if that is a serious thing to consider, and if I need to be living and obeying his word, what does it take for me to do that? And just the reality for most of us means a lot of time thinking, praying, reading, meditating, memorizing in his word. So as we go on throughout the rest of this text, the psalmist, I think, is going to give us some of the reasons why he has grown to so love and delight in the word of God. The first one, the first reason is found in verses 98 through 100. And he loves God's word because it gives him wisdom. He loves God's word because it gives him wisdom. He gives kind of three examples of the type of wisdom that God's word has given to him. In verse 98, first he says, Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. So first of all, he gets a wisdom that is greater than his enemies because the word is ever with him. Remember for a second, who are his enemies here in Psalm 119? We've heard quite a bit a lot about them, haven't we? Uh, It seems almost every week he mentioned them in some way or another. He's called his enemies arrogant ones, cursed ones, those who insult, slander, princes who plot against him, taunting him, wicked ones, liars, persecutors, false accusers, trap setters, people who are trying to physically, emotionally, and even spiritually end him. I think these are, that at least gives us a glimpse of the way he felt about the people who were trying to attack him and bring him down and even rip him away from his foundation of faith. So why is he wiser than his enemies? Why is he joyful for the wisdom? Well, he's wiser because he has the word of God. Not only that, but he has it ever with him. If not in, in written form, he has it hidden in his heart. In the face of all that the world could throw at him, he had something better. He had God's word, he knew God's word, and he used God's word to give him life, hope, joy, peace, and satisfaction in the midst of his enemy's greatest pursuits. Nothing could shake him. We talked last week about God's word being our anchor. He had wisdom that was far beyond that of his enemies. Although they tried to knock him down, the word of God held him up. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19 says, The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. That's what we're seeing here in the psalmist. He says, yeah, you're doing this and doing that and tempting me with that and whatever it is. But that's foolishness in comparison to the wisdom of God. Even the greatest of what the world has to offer is foolishness 
in comparison to the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25 says, The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The psalmist had the word ever with him, in his hand and in his heart. So first we see that, that this wisdom made him wiser than his enemies. In verse 99, then, we see that it makes him more understanding than his teachers, because it was his meditation. Look at verse 99. It says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Now, this is kind of a perplexing statement. It seems a little bit proud at first. I have more understanding than all my teachers. And so there, there's a few things that might be going on. We, we're not exactly sure which teachers he's talking about there. It might be that he had some bad teachers. For instance, teachers who maybe taught what was contrary to the word of God. Perhaps he's talking about bad teachers who, although they taught him head knowledge of God's word, did not teach him the importance of obedience or living out the truth of God's word. Maybe it wasn't bad teachers. Maybe it actually was good teachers. And if he did have good teachers, then it would make sense that those teachers were good because they would have directed them beyond their own wisdom toward the wisdom found in God's holy word. I think truly the good teacher would always rejoice if his students progress further than himself. Isn't that the heart of every good teacher? That would be a cause for rejoicing rather than depression or like, how dare you progress further than me? And especially when we're talking about Bible teachers. I think a good Bible teacher is only as good as his willingness to point his pupils beyond himself to the endless perfections of the word of God. The psalmist says, his word is my meditation. Your testimonies are my meditation. We find this truth that deep understanding comes from meditating on the word of God. And now if I could, just as a sidebar, I think sometimes we fall into a trap that we need to hear from teachers and preachers. Or specifically even famous or well-known teachers and preachers. Because for some reason, when Pastor Tyler says it, or when your favorite YouTube pastor says it, it means more than when the Bible says it. That's not true. God's word stands on its own. You don't need me. God obviously gives us teachers and preachers to help us and to guide us, but you have all you need right here. So therefore, let us be Bereans like we see in Acts, who do listen to teachers, who do uh, gain understanding and wisdom and, and help from teachers, but who also then go and take that teaching and compare it straight to God's word to make sure that they are, in fact, leading you in the right direction. As we think about the psalmist here, having more understanding than all of his teachers, I don't think this is a boast about himself being better than his teachers. It's a boast in verse 98, 99, and 100. He is boasting about the word of God and the wisdom that is available there. It's not to downplay the importance of teachers or in the next verse of elders or those who are more aged than himself. Let's just go there. Verse 100 says, I understand more than the aged for I keep your precepts. He has more understanding than the elders, those who are older than him, for he keeps his precepts. Here we are reminded that earthly wisdom is often correlated with life experience, right? So the older we are, the more wisdom we have just from an experience-based understanding. But as we look at biblical wisdom, it seems to be correlated more with obedience and submission to God's word rather than simply knowing God's word or time frame of being exposed to God's word. It's actually amazing 
how many believers, so often myself included, know so much about God's word and yet fail to live it. Once again, here the psalmist is not getting a big head or making proud statements about himself, but rather boasting in the word of God and its benefits as he delights in it. I understand more than the age because I keep your precepts. I obey them. I don't just know them. I don't just meditate on them, but I obey them. Remember, all of this is flowing from verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. I think that's what the psalmist is getting at here. He's not boasting in himself. He's, he's not proud. He's, he's boasting in the Lord and in his holy word. It's the word of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the grace of God that allows the psalmist to know, understand, obey, and enjoy him. To summarize these verses, 98 through 100, where we see the psalmist thankful for the wisdom that the word gives, it's just him exalting the word of God that gives him greater wisdom than his enemies, teachers, and elders. But where does that wisdom come from? It comes from God's word. We see the progression. He has it always with him. It's his constant meditation. He lives in obedience and submission to it. And so we know that if we want wisdom and understanding, it must come from an understanding, a meditation, and an obedience to God's word. Recall the verses of 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. From childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God as profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible gives us wisdom for salvation and for sanctification, for life. We need that wisdom. So let me just take a pause, though, and talk a little bit before we go into the next section about what is wisdom. We're talking a lot about it, but what does wisdom actually mean? A simple definition of wisdom is application of knowledge. Perhaps you could say it's discernment as a result of understanding. So if we're looking at biblical wisdom, that means that wisdom is knowing, understanding, and obeying the word of God. Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6, God says to his people, keep them and do them, speaking about his commands. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all peoples. Notice, keep and do. In Job 12, verse 13, you hopefully know the story of Job and all the hardship that he went through. In the midst of that, there's a lot of wisdom talk, actually, in the book of Job. But just one, one verse, Job 12, 13, says, With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. And so there is no wisdom apart from God, apart from his holy word. So we need to know and keep it. We need to understand and obey it. Proverbs gives us a lot of understanding about what wisdom is. So a couple of verses from Proverbs, first in verses 9, verse 10, or sorry, chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So once again, we, we understand that, that the more we know and understand who God is, we'll be, we'll be led to respond to Him correctly, to fear Him, this idea of reverence and respect of God above all else even above ourselves. Proverbs 8, verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord then is hatred of evil. 
Pride and arrogance and the way of evil are and perverted speech I hate. So you can see this, this kind of transition then that the more we know and understand God and his word, the more we'll fear him and rightly respond to him. And if we're rightly responding to God, we then also will rightly respond to the sin and temptation of the world around us. So listen to this. Biblical wisdom increases your love and respect for God and decreases your appetite for sin. One more text from Proverbs 2, 6 through 12. Just listen to the progression as as we go through these verses here. The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. Discretion, sorry, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil. So as we grow in biblical wisdom, we will grow in our love and respect for God and also our appetite for sin will be diminished. It it obviously will never be gone, right? We still will always have that flesh roaring up within us, but the more that we can put out that fire with the water of the word of God, the easier it will be to gain victory over it. The psalmist has grown in delight in God's word. He's developed a taste for God's word. And he finds it not only gives him wisdom, but it also, God's word, prevents him from foolishness. So verses 101 and 102, not only does it give him wisdom, but it prevents foolishness. Verse 101 tells us that it restrains him or holds him back from committing evil. Verse 101 says, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Notice there that that he's acknowledging the fact that if if I'm not holding back from sin, if I'm not saying no to sin, then I will also not be keeping your word. These two things are mutually exclusive. There's no way to indulge in evil practices while at the same time keeping the word of God. They're incompatible with each other. James 4 reminds us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Sin should be avoided so that obedience may be perfected is the essence of this verse. This is Spurgeon talking again. He says the psalmist would teach us that there is no real reverence for the book where there is not also careful avoidance of every transgressions and of their precepts. How can we as servants of the Lord keep his word if we do not keep our own works and words from being, bringing dishonor upon it? In Romans 12, it's going through some of the marks of a true Christian and what it looks like to live out our new life in Christ. And one of the phrases in there is to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And so the more we yield to sin, the less we'll be yielding to the spirit and therefore the less we'll be walking in the ways of of the Lord. And so the psalmist recognizes that it's, it's God's word that holds back his feet from every evil way in order that he might keep it. Not only that, but God's word helps him to not turn aside from his word. In a sense, this is what the word of God keeps him in the word of God. Right? You may have heard the phrase, either sin will keep you from the book or the book will keep you from sin. That's a little bit about what's going on here in verses 101 and 102. Verse 102 will keep keep him from neglecting God's ways. I think often the temptation for us is to stray a little bit, right? So if, if God's path for us is right here, we think it most beneficial for everybody involved if if we might just take one step off of the path and still walk alongside it so that we're close to it but not fully committed to it that still gives us the freedom to do what we want in certain areas but if you've ever read the pilgrim's progress you'll know that's not a wise way to walk 
we never know how much each little decision will actually take us and continue to veer us further from the truth. I don't know who said this, but I think it's probably true. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And so God's word should always remain the one and only authority and delight of our life. As we develop our taste for God's word and grow in our delight of it, the overall progression of our lives should be less and less appetite for sin and clinging more and more tightly to the word of God. So we've seen that that the word of God gives him wisdom. It keeps him from foolishness. And then the last section here, verses 103 and 104, the psalmist recognizes that the word of God trains his taste buds. Or perhaps you could say it disciplines his desires. We want to develop our taste. We want to improve our hunger and thirst for God's word. And that's what it's doing for him as we get to verses 103 and 104. First of all, to enjoy the truth. In verse 103, he says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. He enjoys the truth of God's word. How many of you have a sweet tooth? Anybody here have a sweet tooth? Okay, we've got quite a few with the sweet tooth in here. Okay, how, how satisfying when you're like on a road trip or something and you don't have any way to satisfy that sweet tooth and you finally are able to stop at the gas station and get a bunch of sugar. Okay, that, that's, that's the sweetness of God's word. Right? We, we know, of course, that God's word is also more valuable to, valuable to us than candy. But, but that's, the, that's the kind of craving and desire that it fulfills. Right, God's word, we're told in the New Testament, in some cases, is the milk that gives us life. Jesus said the words of God are the bread of life. We see in other passages that God's word is also the, the food, right? the meat and potatoes that we need to be healthy and vibrant and living. But it also is so sweet to us at the same time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It trains his taste buds to enjoy the truth and then also to despise falsehood. See, this is the continuing cycle that we see over and over throughout this passage. Verse 104, to despise falsehood. He says, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. See, the, the more we're chewing and meditating and enjoying the sweetness of God's word. When we get something in our mouth that is not the sweetness of God's word, we will spit it out faster than you could ever imagine. Okay, we, we've been playing church softball, and I like to eat sunflower seeds while, while I play softball. But if you've eaten sunflower seeds, you know every once in a while you get a rotten one. And when you crack open that seed and you bite into that, that sunflower seed, it, it's just terrible. It's awful. And you just want to spit it out as fast as you can. Okay, the, the good ones are, are delicious and they're salty and they're, they're awesome, but, but it doesn't take much. You, you can know in, in a matter of seconds when that bad one gets in there. And so the same is true of us as, as we dive deeper and, and enjoy more God's word when those temptations come, when those sins come, when those lies try to creep into our hearts and minds, we will spit them out if we've been feasting on the word of God. We know that those hold no comparison to the sweetness of his word. The problem, of course, is that Satan is tricky, right? He wants to disrupt the cycle of knowing and growing and obeying and delighting in and therefore knowing more and reading more and meditating more and he doesn't want that to happen in our life and so he's crafty he comes to us as an angel of light he presents these things of the world in ways that makes them seem irresistible but that's another reason why we need the truth of god's word proverbs fourteen twelve says there is a way that seems right to man but its end is the way to death. 
And so this morning, what I'd like you to do is just consider this kind of cycle that the psalmist has been walking through. Right? He loves the, he loves the law. So he meditates on it. The more he meditates on it, he gets more wisdom and understanding. The more he understands, the more he hates sin. And the more he hates sin, the more he loves God's word. And the more he loves God's word, the more he wants to read God's word. And and so on and so forth. And you can see that cycle. And so the challenge for us is when that cycle gets disrupted, how do we respond? Where do we go to? Sometimes I think we maybe have entered into our own new cycle where we we look at the cycle that the psalmist is going through and we just think, well, I can't attain that. And so I'm going to stay here in my cycle of comfort, of living for myself rather than God. It's the cycle that I know ultimately is not as satisfying ultimately not even as comfortable ultimately will lead to death and no good thing how foolish of us to think that we can create patterns of life that will be more fulfilling than what God has created for us if you're here this morning and you, you feel like you struggle to, to remain in that cycle, I want you to know that I'm with you. You know, it's, it's a daily battle. It's a, it's a daily fight to be pursuing and living and obeying. But it's worth it. And so if you have been out of that cycle or maybe you are, are finding it difficult to enter back into that loving and meditating and obeying. Maybe ask yourself some tough questions. What might be keeping me from savoring the sweetness of God's holy word? Might there be sin you need to confess? Might there be certain comforts that you're unwilling to lay aside for the surpassing weight of God's holy word. Commit yourself fully to the Lord. We enter this cycle daily, and I'm so glad that this happened to line up with Communion Sunday. Because that's that's the hope, and that's the the smile, and, and that's the joy that we have in knowing that if we do confess our sins, He is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But let's ask us, ask ourselves the hard questions. What am I loving more than God? What am I meditating on more than his word? What am I choosing above obedience? What should I let go of in order to pursue the deep satisfaction and delight of God's holy word? One author said this about this passage, kind of in summary. He said, Now let us turn and inquire. What is our daily use of the word of God? Are we satisfied with a slight looking? Or do we seek an intimate acquaintance with it? Is it our influence ever present and ever practical? Do we prize it as a welcome guest? Is it our delightful companion and guide? Oh, meditate on this blessed book. Eat the word, and when you have found it, it will be unto you the joy and rejoicing of your heart. The name of Jesus is its great subject. It will be more precious. Your love will be inflamed, your perseverance established, and your heart enlivened in the spirit of praise. Thus bringing your mind in close and continual contact with the testimonies of God and pressing out the sweetness from the precious volume. It will drop as from the honeycomb daily comfort and refreshment upon your heart. Let's pursue that. May we develop our taste for God's holy word.
May we grow in our delight of it. May we enjoy its wisdom. May we run from evil. And may we enjoy its sweetness. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love toward us. Thank you for being so faithful to us, even when we are not. Lord, help us. Change us. Use your spirit and your word to mold us more into your image each and every day. Lord, we pray for your strength, for your grace, for your mercy, and for your spirit to do this work within us. We know that we cannot magically conjure up this desire. We cannot change our taste buds on our own. But you can do that. And so help us to do what is within our power. Help us to discipline ourselves. Help us to seek accountability. Help us to confess sin. Help us to pursue you with all that we have. So that we might make available to us the riches and the promises and the perfections of your holy word. Help us to delight in you and in your word. In your name we pray. Amen.